we're joined today by former sports photographer, Fleet Street picture editor and now renowned media commentator, Eamon McCabe. Welcome, Eamon. Hello, Bob. Um, could we begin all the way back in the, I think it was the 60s when you, when you began in photography, but what really sparked your interest in photography? One day I was taking my father to, uh, dog racing and I had a, I had a camera in the, in the car. I was shooting old Austin 7s and stuff for fun. I was a car enthusiast. And so I had a, a very basic camera setup. But I took my dad dog racing down in, uh, in Haringey and we um, passed a, a Jaguar, a red Jaguar, which had driven into uh, a fruit stand or a, a greengrocer's. And there was fruit everywhere and the red Jaguar you know, was disappearing into the shop. And I took this picture and I um, processed it and took it to the local paper and they published it. And it was such a thrill to get something I'd taken into a paper with my name on it. And I, I was hooked, but didn't know anything about the business, didn't know anything about the trade. But I, I was restless, so I wanted to travel. And I managed to go to, to uh, California, hitching when I was about 18 or 19, hitching around. And whilst you were in California, yeah. you, you went to the Altamont um, Yeah, festival. just before I left, it was in the sort of November, December time. Uh, the Stones were touring and um, Woodstock had happened the previous summer and Jago wanted to have this sort of free festival and it was in an old uh, racetrack. But, and I was doing bands like Crosby, Stills and Nash, uh, which were fantastic, and uh, the Jefferson Aeroplane and, you know, real classic. You know, I was in my elements. I was a young kid, I loved music and I was photographing my heroes. But it was, it was a fan taking pictures. But I was full of film, full of, full of music, and you know, photographed um, some of my friends, obviously in the States. But when I came home, and I managed to get a job with a, a, a you know, the occasional job with a, a photographer called Alec Byrne, and I enjoyed that. But a guy in the, in, one, in the sports agency that I shared a building with, or we shared a building with, said, what are you doing tomorrow? Could you do Spurs for us? And I went to do Spurs, and it made the Sunday People, the Sunday Express. And again, I was hooked, I got published, and I thought, this is what I could do. This is where my energies go. Local papers were my entry. I got into local papers, the Southgate Gazette, the Tottenham Herald, the Barnet Press, the Hampstead and Highgate Express. I was syndicating. And then I started to get pictures in papers like the Telegraph from Spurs and Arsenal, as well as the local papers. And that's really how I got going. So I enjoyed that. And then I gradually then uh, started to work for The Guardian because they noticed I was doing Arsenal Spurs and, and then you suddenly get a call, can you go and do Chelsea or something like that or Barney. For myself, for a, one paper, The yeah, Guardian, the which gave me a great start and I was working with great people like Frank Keating and David Lacey and people like that. And it was, um, it was great. I really enjoyed myself there and uh, you know there, there was a lighter touch in the writing and that gave me a lighter touch with my photography a little bit of humour, a little bit of wit, and that's, if I have a style of any sort, it's, it's that. And also, um, you know, the, the, the paper enabled me to try things out, and they were very, very trusting, and I enjoyed that. And you were noticed, clearly, in that. I was noticed, yeah. yeah. But, well, yeah. Did you have a favourite sport? Was football all, all you were doing, or were you doing Well, football was, was, was the main, the main gruel, because it's what everyone loved. Um, Later, I was lucky when I went on to the Observer, I was lucky to do a lot of minor sports. But at the Guardian, it was pretty much football, rugby and um, rowing, lots of rowing. But then I'm there for a couple of years, I'm getting a good cuttings portfolio. And I noticed one day my hero of all time, Chris Smith, was in the Sunday Times. And I thought, how come he's not in the Observer? You know, why is he in the Sunday Times? And I rang the, the uh, picture editor up of the, Guardian, of the Observer and said, you know, I noticed Chris has moved on. Are you looking for anyone? He said, well, come on in. He said, but what are you doing tonight? And I said, well, I'd love to have gone to the England-Holland game, but I can't get a pass. And he said, well, look, do it for us, but don't do anyone else except Joanne Cruyff. That's just all you've got to do. Just follow him the whole Just follow the him the whole, whole game, right. which is a lovely brief, because often in these games, you, you know, you don't quite know what the stories might be. Uh, I printed six of uh, Cruyff doing pointing walking with the ball he was in such control yeah he was a magician wasn't a magician he? and yeah. and I woke up on the Sunday morning and they'd run five of them across a page and I was so excited I thought this is it this is this is what I want to do but then I never heard for three months somebody else had got the job and uh, funny enough I got called in to do um, 
lacrosse after that. And I managed to get a picture on the inside back page of lacrosse and then stayed there for another 10 years. And being on the Observer, it's a weekly paper obviously coming out on a Sunday, that must have given you a fairly, fairly free reign to look at portraiture and, uh, and, and, yeah, and, and, and minority sports, you sp spoke about lacrosse. So yeah. the paper, how, how did they treat you? Did they let you get on with it? Or how well, I think the main you? thing to remember back then is we only had three pages. When you think of the sports pages now, the Observer, the Guardian, you know, the, certainly the Observer would be a section, you know, maybe 24 pages. So we had three. One thing I had to go and find was a, almost a freestanding picture every week, something that was just pictorial. Not for the early edition. For early, early edition and also sometimes in the inside back page. And I, some of those were great because I could do boxing training. Um, I could do, uh, I remember one of my famous pictures was a the Chinese table tennis were over, team were over, and I went, I thought I'll go and do, see what that looks like. And I get there and there's a, I walk into a, the Edmonton um, Leisure Centre with not very good lighting and not very big stadium. And I walk in and as soon as I walk in, a little Chinese face is throwing a table tennis ball high into the air. I thought, wow, what a picture. Please God, he does it again. And he did it twice. And I got one where it was three quarters up in the air, and another one where it was right at the top. And the one on the top made the picture. And it went into the, um, the inside back page of, of the Observer, about 12 inches deep, three columns wide, without my byline. I've never forgotten that. Um, but it went on to win Sports Picture of the Year and probably got me a career in photography in sports photography. You feel that really launched? Yeah, I think people launch. often say, yeah. I don't know that guy's, guy's name, but he's the one who took, took the table that. tennis picture. Okay. It's yeah. one of those sort of things. Yeah. If, if I had any luck in the Observer Times, it was shooting lots of different sports, which helped made a varied portfolio. It wasn't all football, it wasn't all rugby. I could do, hopefully, a decent football picture from somewhere of something going on, with then maybe table tennis or under underwater hockey or cross-country running. And if you're judging and you see 10 different pitches, you've got a chance. Yes, the variety. When you went to a football match, you, you, you didn't have to worry about um, the winning goal or anything like that. You, if it happened, it happened. But you, um, you were always observing and looking for something a little bit left of centre, if you like. That, well, um, my, 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 my dream situation used to be showing people something they couldn't see on television. I was really very anti just reproducing Match of the Day or something like that. I thought, well, you watch Match of the Day, uh, which I loved, and you know, while I was working, I still love it now. But I, what's the point of having the same picture as they've got? And f when I was in my element, I'd be in dressing rooms, I'd be in boxes, the, often the loser of a boxing match, I'd be in their dressing room getting that picture because television didn't show that, didn't get that. And that was always my aim, was to try and show people behind the scenes. And it, and it was, at that time, it was manageable. You didn't have all these super agents. You didn't have security as tough. You had to use the gift of the gab to get to some of these places. But I, you know, I think if you treated people with respect, they would let you in. And I'd say, and you, I would never be cruel to some. You know, if, if a boxer really was sick after peeing, beaten or you know in really badly I would never run that I wouldn't even show that but in terms of I thought that's me doing my job I'm I'm giving people a sneak preview of what goes on behind the scenes and that's where I was in my real element and that's why I love boxing training I love doing boxing training and I was trying to capture what it, what are the what drives these people to do all this work which we don't see on telly or whatever and that's what makes champions and I loved that, and I loved being with these people for an hour, two hours, getting the sweat, getting the sort of effort. And if I could capture that, that was me showing the, the, the viewer of The Observer, who loved their boxing, they loved their boxing, uh, obviously through the great writing as well, you know. And that was me working at the peak of my, my real powers and interest. In the 1980s, in football terms, we were looking at Liverpool were, were going strong. Nottingham Forest were, well, late 70s, early 80s, Nottingham Forest were really pushing them hard. Um, I remember a game at Anfield that we were both at, and uh, it was a bit of a ding-dong, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. Uh, what do you recall from that? Uh, well, that I remember day? it being a war rather than a ding-dong. <laughs> okay. But I, I've, got, I, I've got this freedom. It's a midweek game. I don't have to produce for tomorrow morning. I'm producing for four or five days later. 
So what is this war of attrition going on at Anfield? What is it? And it starts on the bench. The benches are rowing. You know, you get Cluffy, you know, up to his usual antics. So I'm, I'm covering that bit, trying to get down there until I get shooed away by him. Then the game starts and it's, a, it's, it's floodlit Anfield. It's got everything. Drama. And um, sure enough, um, Kennedy does swing a punch at uh, Bowyer and... Uh, and I got the picture, and in the end, that said more than the golds and whatever. Um, I was lucky. I yeah. I mean, I always tried to get the goals because we're competitive, and you know, your dream is always to get a flying header in the 89th minute, which will sum a game up. But photography, you, you know, in sports photography, you have to be ready for everything: a punch on the pitch, or um, a row in the stands, or whatever it might be. So it, you know, you're on your adrenaline for an hour and a half. Which is why we do it. Yeah. Well, you, you modestly um, say that you, you watch Cluffy a little bit. You actually mm -hmm. got a, a very interesting picture of Cluffy and of Paisley, mm -hmm. which shows humour again. Yeah, well, it's it's it, it it's seeing things come together. As I think there's something in our brains. Why did that click with me? You know, is probably not a very interesting thing to stop and photograph, but it worked for me. And and Cluffy and and everyone bending over in the in the dugout made a picture, and I thought. I thought that's that's funny, you know. Exactly. And and I, you know, we're all different. If you put ten of us together at a match, as we all used to sit together, but we took different pictures. And yeah, you also collaborated with Desmond Morris on a book. Um, yeah, I did a book on the soccer, soccer tribe. tribe. Yeah, which was <laughs> which was fascinating, and a very lively time. It was when um, West Ham won the cup. So in and West Ham are probably our most tribal football supporters. You know, when you think when, I mean, very, at that time, you know, the sort of early 80s. And it was, but it, it paid off because I remember, mainly because of that book, I'd spent a day with West Ham when they won the cup, the fans when they won the cup. And that's probably one of the best days I've had because the, the, the whole of the East End went bananas. Uh, everything from people in cars to fans with cardboard cups on their, you know, FA cups on their windows to balcony pictures it was just you know maybe without that assignment i might not have been there you know i probably would have gone but yeah, i was that, doing that everything purpose, but yeah sure. exactly yeah. hooliganism you can't get away from it in yeah. the 1980s um some of your images from that would show graffiti and 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 the um well very tribal mm. west ham and tottenham yeah 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 i'm a big tottenham fan and uh, i'm ashamed to say we, we were amongst the worst you know and uh, it got very nasty um, and quite scary. I mean, but it all over. I remember being a Derby Man United game, and those little side streets in Derby. I remember with you know we used to have our steel case full of cameras and all that, and I remember really being very scared of Man U fans on the rampage, and we had to as a paper decide how much football do you do, you know, for a general audience. You know, f football now is very fashionable. You can't get into football unless you've got a lot of money. It's gone very upmarket. In my day, football was working class game. It's, it's, it's funny, I've never forgotten when I was at school and I used to go to football, people used to take the piss out of me because I was going to football matches. Now, these people are account directors and um, you know men of money. They've all got boxes at football clubs. I love the turnaround. They now go to football and it's no longer a working class sport. You know. So you, when you're working in newspapers and, and you're working day to day, mm. never really... Um, think about the historical importance of any of the images that you were taking. Oh, you do. Oh, you, you do. Yeah, you are aware of doing history. I mean, you know, if you want to go on to, say, Heisel, you know, where mm. I, I was um, photographing, I, I was very aware that Heisel Stadium, I was again sent by my newspaper, The Observer, abroad to do a, a, a football match, and it, it all went wrong, and I got the pictures which still now, 30 years later, 40 years later, people want to talk about and see. And that, so that is important. That was, I thought, I've got to get this right. Do you think at the time the camera was, a, was between you and the reality of it all? Yeah, I think so. I mean, what happened, if you want me to go through it, I, what happened was I was at one end doing the very colourful Juventus fans and it was making lovely pictures, exotic pictures for me, flares and um, big flags and everything. And I looked down the other end of the stadium and a red wave ran from one side to the other. Now, I've been to hundreds of football matches where this has happened. You get a skirmish, game starts, and then you never, never process the film. 
I get down there and the red, the red um, wave is running from one right to left. And just as I get to the wall where the uh, Juventus fans are, the wall cracks and breaks over me, you know. And I had a sure shot camera for the trophy pictures at the end. Took two frames and then got out of there. And so that is, a, yes, the camera. But that, at that time, nobody was dead. You know, it was people in trouble. Um, I did see then later people being pulled off the terraces, dying on the pitch. But I didn't know what was happening. You now know what's happened then. I didn't know. Um, I can now tell you 39 people died. But at the time, nobody was dead. And you can't edit as you go along. You have to shoot and let somebody else decide what to show. And we did show that one picture of them all reaching, which you know, went around the world as a, as a picture of the, of, of the horror. I know that that had a profound effect on your feelings towards photographing sport and football in particular. Yeah, it did. I, I kind of, looking back on it, that was 85. I, I went back and I worked, at, you know, did a few, a few more bits and stuff. But I never really felt, I was never in love with it again. I, I, took, I wanted to take the challenge up of being picture editor of The Guardian, uh, a former paper of mine when I, you know, used to work with Frank Keating and David Lacey. Um, and I, I reached the end of my sports thing, really, whether Heisel had much to do with it, I could never really work it out, but I'd done enough. You know, I did three Olympics and that was enough for me. And I wanted the challenge. I was 40 years of age and I wanted the challenge of really getting a paper back into shape. It's hard to imagine now because everything has changed so much. We get our first newspaper on, on screen before we go to bed, we look at papers. Then they were bought at newsstands. So if there's a belting picture on the front, it could be even a quizzical picture. So what is that? Mm -hmm. You know, you, we had to find some device to make people stop and pay their money for the paper. And that really was my job. I, I think in my career, I've reinvented myself four times. I, I was a music photographer. How I outgrew that, I got into sports. Heisel probably got me out of sport because I thought if that's sport, you can have it. I wasn't that dedicated to it anymore. Then I went on to picture edit for about 15 years and loved every minute of that and then at the, the end the last best part of 20 years I've been doing portraits of people in the arts which I've really l enjoyed. What's your how do you approach one of, one of those portraits because I presume you don't get very long with some of them. Some of them do I mean if you can get into a studio with a painter then you've got a chance okay. because you've got all the paraphernalia of painting. If, if you get somebody like a film star and you're given the 10 minutes that everyone gets that's hard because you come into a, a situation a little bit like where we are now and all the lights are on and you've got to get on, get a, portraiture is very intimate. To take a portrait of somebody that's going to last is quite an intimate experience. My picture of Zadie Smith, I've got a nice portrait of Zadie Smith, publishers um, boardroom. It was always a killer because there's, there's nothing of theirs in the room. So you go in, I put a, 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 a soft box up, you know, uh, for a light. And I, I always work with just one light and a, usually a portrait lens, a 120 millimeter lens. And she comes in and she's beautiful. She'd just written a book called On Beauty. And she's in a beautiful colored dress. She's got bangles to die for. She's got a turban, a photographer's dream, you know. And she's sitting, I found that the only thing I did find in the room was a beautiful leather chair, crusty old leather chair, which must have been in Penguin's offices for 100 years. So I thought I got my, my, my uh, location and I put her down and she's sitting bolt upright in the chair and looking beautiful but it's, it's, it's no, there's no feeling in the picture no intimacy and then right at the end when uh, these pictures are a little cold and a little stiff I said to her any chance you could just lean back and when she leans back into the chair it suddenly becomes intimate we suddenly become look like we could be friends or dare I say it, lovers. You know, we, there's, a, there's a, an energy that comes between the sitter and the photographer. And it all came just from saying, could, could you just lean back? Because, I mean, what's the worst she could have said? No, I, don't, I choose not to do that. We shake hands and she goes, you know. But she did it. And if you look at it, you can just see the movement. The head goes back and it's a different picture. And it was used in Time magazine, you know. And, and so I, for that one moment, I achieved beauty. And it was just through somebody said, can you just put your head back? And I realised what it is when I, when I try and 
work it all out. I enjoy photographing people older than me who've done something in the arts. Actors, poets, poets, I love poets. What makes a poet keep going when they're, they're selling books for three bob a time? You know, there, there's no money in poetry. And yet I've met people living in little rooms in Camden Town that were the most brilliant company. And they're just driven by their words, by what they write down. And it, it's, it's really, um, what's the word? It makes, it makes you want to just keep going. It makes you want to do your own thing. Painters, you know, um, Maggie Hamlin, a great friend of mine, keeps painting away, keeps getting slated for the stuff that she does, and keeps bouncing back. You know, what keeps these people going in their 70s and their 80s? Um, what keeps a writer go writing to their 80-odd? Um, it's a privilege to spend time with these people. And they're creative types, and you hope that some of it's going to rub off on you in your own practice. You know, you don't copy each other, but people give you permission to keep looking. And that's what I've really enjoyed is being able to keep looking. <laughs>